At this time, I would like to invite the Honorable Tara Rivers, Minister of Education, Employment and Gender Affairs, to come and give her remarks. Minister Rivers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I know that protocol has already been established, but I also want to recognize and thank the Honorable Premier for being here this morning, and also the Honorable Minister Bodden, colleagues of mine from Cabinet, and of course, Councillor Conley, who has been a part of this journey with me from day one. The presence of my colleagues in Cabinet, in particular the Premier, should indicate to you how important we believe as a government you are to not just the education system, but to this country as a whole. And so I thank members of Cabinet, I thank members of the government who are here to underscore that importance this morning with us. I also want to recognize the fact that I see in my program I'm supposed to speak for 15 minutes. Well, I'm not going to apologize, but I'm going to state right up front. It is unlikely that I will be able to speak for 15 minutes. However, I will say that I will speak directly, so time will not be lost on superfluous conversation. With that, I want to say thank you. Thank you all, first and foremost, for your dedicated and your hard work and your commitment to the children of the Cayman Islands and to your invaluable service that you provide to our country. We all know that progress of our students the achievement, by and large, of our students is greatly dependent on their teachers. Your dedication to the teaching profession is to be commended, to be recognized, and to be supported. I want to say a special welcome to the new teachers joining us this academic year. I had the opportunity of meeting with them last week, but I want to reiterate my thanks for choosing to be a part of this very exciting time during our education process. And I want to say a special welcome to the returning Caymanian teachers, the returning graduates, or those that may have been outside of our system for a while and decided to come back home. Thank you for taking that decision to help us in this journey that we are embarking as well. You know, as educators, your job is truly monumental. You are currently preparing our students for jobs and careers that, let's face it, in many cases do not exist yet. Teaching is no longer just about imparting knowledge. Instead, it is much more about helping our children to become critical and adaptive thinkers, helping them to develop the skills to synthesize the skills to analyze the amount of information which is often readily accessible, not by what you say, but at the click of a mouse. You therefore have an awesome responsibility. Where you fail to carry out your ever-evolving responsibilities in an effective manner, our children fail. Where you succeed in doing so, our children, in turn, succeed. It's that simple. Principals, you have an equally great responsibility. You are responsible to ensure that our children that are entrusted in your care at your school do not fail. If you do not effectively manage and deploy the resources available in and to your school, you fail our children. 
if the education system as a whole does not provide adequate resources to meet the needs of our children, then as a country, we fail our children. We cannot afford to fail our children. Because if we fail our children, we condemn our nation. Over the past two years, this government has demonstrated our commitment to pursuing what can be described, in essence, as a singular focus. And that is raising standards in education and addressing the educational needs of all of our children. Over the past two years, this government has also demonstrated the value we, we place on the viewpoints of all education stakeholders through ongoing consultation. In particular, I have met with school staff, parents, students, employer groups, and the wider ed community at large to listen to their feedback about the Cayman Islands public education system. From this ongoing consultation, school visits, reviews of the school data, and assessments conducted, it is evident, whilst there are some good areas of practice being carried out throughout the schools, there is no denying that, and being carried out throughout the education system more generally, major improvements are still needed. There is also no denying that. So what I would like to give a brief overview for those of you that may be just joining us this year, and to remind those of you that have been here since I've been here, is to give a brief overview of the journey, as I'd like to say, since May 2013. The journey to improve the quality and standards of education in the Cayman Islands. 2013-14 year, I would dub as the year of continuity and discovery. For those of you who were in attendance in the August 2013 event, such as this that happened, as a newly elected and appointed Minister of Education, I gave a commitment on behalf of the government to follow through with the key initiatives previously underway in education, namely the National Strategic Plan for Education 2012 to 2017. By and large, that plan in itself was a continuation of the education reform efforts that started during the previous PPM administration and administrations prior to that. As I've said before, and I will say again, education is a process. What was evident, though, from stakeholder cons consultation, which started very earlier, very early in our tenure as minister and counselor for education was that the education system needed focus, even given the strategic plan for education 2012-2017. In order to streamline the processes and fill gaps identified in the strategic plan as minister, I therefore introduced six strategic priorities for education. And again, just to recap what these strategic priorities are and which have been expressed to you in this forum previously. Firstly, a focus on international competitiveness and raising standards. That is the paramount strategic priority of education, which all other strategic priorities flow therefrom. Focusing on strengthening provision for children with special education needs and disabilities, including the provision for students who are considered gifted and talented. So students at, quote unquote, all ends of the spectrum. Focusing on conflict resolution training and crime reduction strategy. Focusing on strengthening provision for technical and vocational education, otherwise known as TVET training, to be obtained within the secondary school system before our children leave compulsory education. 
focusing on information and communication technology integration to support teaching methodology and pedagogy. And finally, focusing on enhancing public-private partnerships in education and training for the benefit of our children. These focus areas acted as a guide for the education team in the ministry to develop a number of strategies and initiatives designed to provide the system with the necessary support and directions to raise standards and to address the educational needs of all of our children. Moving to 2014-2015 school year, a year of critical analysis and laying the foundation by addressing the gaps. The an eternal, an internal assessment of behavior management was conducted by the ministry staff during the previous 2013-14 year to determine where the effectiveness of the system lied and where the weaknesses amongst the ex existing structures also lie. And in 2014-2015 year, last year, we began to address known gaps, such as revising the student code of conduct, which is a, and the teacher guidance handbook, revising the national homeschool agreement for high schools, and the national use of cell phones and other electronic equipment, and revising the national uniform and dress code. We also launched a new behavior support team and strengthened the relationships and defined expectations through service level agreements between the schools and special, special support units, such as stepping stones and cornerstones. We also launched the Pastoral Support Worker Program, which was developed shortly after taking office in the summer of 2013, which provides support to guide students in need of this additional support during the school day with the aim of ensuring that they engage with learning and access additional or educational opportunities. We strengthen the role of the special needs coordinators. And in fact, in 2015, 2016 academic year, this academic year, I'm happy to report that I have been advised that every school will have access to a non-teaching SENCO who will be responsible for assisting with the coordination and oversight of provision and services for students with special education needs and disabilities in our schools. We also hosted a national educational conference with a focus on effectively dealing with behavior challenges and inclusion, held here in February of this year. The conference, the conference involved all government school staff and private schools were also invited. The conference included a key note address by the renowned educator, Dr. Avis Glaze. Educators took part in professional development workshops to improve your skills and better equip you to develop inclusive learning environments and experiences for all our students. Another critical area of feedback received from stakeholders during the 2013-14 academic year and beyond was the need for independent evaluations of our education system. Therefore, during the 2014-2015 school year, as the acting chief officer indicated in his remarks, the Ministry of Education commissioned baseline schools inspections of all government schools, as well as a review of the governance model for education. The inspections have been completed and the reports have been delivered to the ministry. So now, on to 2015-2016. A year of increased accountability and strengthened reporting mechanisms. The overarching goal of the work to be done this academic year will be on raising standards of education through increased accountability. There must be a relentless and unequivocal approach taken to raising standards and increasing accountability at all levels in our education system. 
There can be no excuses in this regard. Baseline inspections of all government schools have been conducted, and as I said, the results are in. I will speak briefly regarding the outcomes of the inspections before discussing education governance review in very brief terms. The overall finding of the inspections is that most government schools have had improvement in terms of student performance across the board. That is clearly identified and reflected in those reports. However, the results are still significantly below the expected minimum standards when compared to international standards. Generally, the findings are that in English, mathematics, and the practical aspects of science, overall achievement is significantly lower than UK norms by at least one year. The inspections revealed that a number of other shortcomings in the system, including several human resources related issues related to recruitment, retention, and deployment of high quality teaching staff, the need for better appraisal and performance management practices for underperforming staff, the need to increase resourcing and improve training and support for the management of special education needs and behavioral issues, and the need to ensure that teaching assistants are effectively deployed and supervised, the need for better collection and use of assessment data, and the monitoring of a performance trends over time, more targeted induction and professional development programs to meet the needs of teachers and support staff, and the lack of inter-school support and exchange of ideas, good practice, and successes, which is believed to be vital to help improve overall performance at schools. The inspections overview report also recommends that the criteria for success for secondary schools be expanded beyond targets for proportion of level two passes only. One of the key recommendations of the governance review was to enhance accountability in the education system through increased and more targeted reporting of key performance indicators and more detailed regular reporting by each school on such indicators. The review also highlighted the fact that many stakeholders in education, including parents, including principals, including teachers themselves, yourselves, believe the schools needed more autonomy in their day-to-day -day operations. There, is, there has been some overlap in the findings from the inspections report and the education review. And importantly, these findings have been consistent. The, these reports will be made public once the schools receive your final reports and you've had a chance to see the details therein. This means, just given the overview that I've just provided, this means that there is still a lot of work to be done. And while it's important to recognize some improvement year over year in recent years, we have seen that and we need to recognize that. And as a country, as a government, we do recognize that. It is also important to recognize that it is to a standard that is simply not good enough for the long run. However, it is also important to recognize that the issues facing the education system did not arrive here overnight. These problems, these issues, these challenges, and putting it in a positive spin. These opportunities have been a long, long time coming over many, many years, which have been compounded, unfortunately, by a number of factors over many years. I would like to also emphasize that the ministry and the government has taken a proactive 
not a reactive approach to dealing with these issues. It's important to point out that while the baseline school inspections and the education governance review were taking place during this past academic year, the education teams in the ministry were tasked with implementing strategies and initiatives to address the six strategic areas of priority discussed previously. Once I was able to get a lay of the land, so to speak, a decent understanding of what was happening in the system from the assessments, from the meetings, from the internal discussions, as well as external stakeholder discussions during the 2013-14 academic year, as minister and as a government, we didn't want to wait until the inspections were complete before putting much needed improvements in place. In fact, now that I have received and have seen the results of the reports themselves, those reports actually lend a validation of sorts. They validate the importance and appropriateness of the strategic priority areas of focus established and the initiatives undertaken since taking office in 2013. In addition to what was discussed previously, I would like to briefly share some of the targeted work that has taken place during the 2014-2015 academic year to help you as educators to do your jobs better with respect to meeting the needs of our children. And then I will speak briefly about the plan going forward for 2015-2016 school year. And in the interest of time, I will only briefly mention these highlights of the past academic year. And the ministry has committed to making a full list available on the Ministry of Education website in a document which will be entitled Education Progress Report 2014-2015 in the coming days. So the highlights from the Education Progress Report of the last academic year. As a country, we introduced International Leadership Certificate through Ontario's Principals Council. All principals and deputy principals who are currently in the system began a certificate program of the International School Leadership Certificate facilitated by the OPC using a framework which was contextualized locally for the Cayman Islands experience, but which was based on international best practice. This program aims to support principals and senior managers in developing strategies to more effectively manage your schools. New principals and deputy principals, as well as emerging leaders in our schools, will also have the opportunity to participate in this new PD program this coming year and training for existing principals and deputy principals will continue this year as well. Standards-based writing and reading guidance for key stage one, years one through three. This guidance on effective writing and reading instruction is a professional learning tool that has been developed and launched to provide support for teachers planning and practice in key stage one. The document explores the essential components of necessary for the development of an effective early years writing program, as well as set the foundation for future student achievement. And I will speak more to the teaching and learning strategy, which will be launched this year that is tied in with this type of instructional tool that has been developed to support you as educators. Technical and vocational programs geared to students with a range of academic abilities and interests have also been focused on this year and a strategy has been developed to create pathways for students while still in compulsory education by building on and expanding school TVET qualifications and attempting to map into post-secondary education and university education. There is an emphasis on partnerships with the private sector through apprenticeships and work experience. And I'm happy to say that the government is in the process of convening a national training council and appointing a TVET coordinator to assist in further developing and implementing this strategy in the coming academic year. 
As you all know, new graduation criteria was adopted at the end of year 12 in 2014. These criteria are required to be met in order to graduate. And the criteria is based currently on, on attendance, on behavior, and academic achievement. The criteria are being further reviewed with a view to include aspects of citizenship and community service. And this speaks directly and aligns with the key recommendations made in the inspections overview report regarding broadening the success criteria at the secondary school level. We have also focused on developing greater partnerships in public-private partnerships in education during the 2014-15 school year. And some examples of these partnerships include developing new partnerships with life, literacy is for everyone. In addition to the other partnerships currently or existing at the primary level, in September of 2014, LIFE, in partnership with the DES, John Gray High School, and the Ministry of Education, launched a reading intervention program to support struggling readers in year seven. LIFE is an independent charitable organization dedicated to addressing literacy issues in the Cayman Islands. The level literacy intervention program being used in John Gray High School was selected as an effective program for schools because it is a supplementary small group intervention program that encapsulates three key aspects, three keys to successful literary instruction. Expert teaching, quality leveled books, and good instructional design. Students have shown improvement as assessed by life themselves and have responded well to the interventions. We have also established a new public-private partnership in education with Cayman Finance. The Ministry of Education, Employment, and Gender Affairs, the Ministry of Financial Services, Commerce, and Environment, and Cayman Finance developed and worked in a cooperative partnership to offer an education and work experience initiative to participating year 12 students in a dual enrollment system. Those attending either first year of A-levels or UCCI as a part of year 12 program. We know that our SciFEC students had a robust internship program which was built into that curriculum. However, they, this was a major gap that existed for our students in the dual entry program and we have been able to not just identify that but seek and work to address that in collaboration and in partnership with Cayman Finance. The past academic year, we've continued with other private, private public partnerships in education with the Cayman Islands Society of Professional Accountants for the provision that they provide critical support for teaching of mathematics and numeracy initiatives in our primary schools, and we thank them for that. And we have continued to partner with Hedge Funds Care with respect to the provision of financial support to facilitate child abuse prevention and appropriate interventions in the schools. So as you can see, we have not sat back and waited for the outcomes of the inspection reports. The ministry was tasked with and has been making efforts to improve the education system while being externally evaluated while the system was being externally evaluated. I have only listed a few of these education initiatives undertaken during the past year, and as I said, the full list will be made available on the Ministry of Education website for public consumption. Again, it is important to stress that even though initiatives have been put in place over the past two years, there is still a lot of work to be done. This upcoming school year will not be business as usual. As representatives of the education system, you have a duty to be even more responsive to the needs of our students. 
and to ensure that each child in your care reaches their fullest potential. So going into the 2015-2016 school year, the vision for education is simple. Children first. No excuses, just solutions. This statement takes us back to the basics. Children first. As it relates to education, every decision we make as a government, every decision we make, or every decision made in the Ministry of Education, every decision made at the Department of, of Education Services, and every decision made at each respective school must be made for the benefit of our children. It is that simple. It is only through this unwavering conviction that we will continue to raise our standards and to hopefully exceed an acceptable level and be able to offer a world-class education system. Educators, under your leadership and tutelage, our young minds progress in their journey in education and they rely on you to consistently provide them with quality teaching to enable their learning and development. Therefore, it is essential that you embrace this vision of children first, no excuses, just solutions. For some of you, this is also your vision for education and has always been. For others of you, this may require a shift in your thinking, but it is an essential one to make, starting now. At the recent Professional Development Education Conference held earlier this year, you had the pleasure of working with Dr. Avis Glaze, as I indicated earlier, a world-renowned educator and leader in education reform efforts worldwide. And I will share with you just a few words that resonated with me, and I'm sure resonated with many of you as well, and that speaks to the vision of putting children first. She said, and I might be paraphrasing a bit here, parents send to school the best kids they have. They're not holding back, or they're not hiding the better ones at home. Keep that in mind as you begin the school year, as our children deserve the best that you have to offer as educators, and they must be afforded every opportunity for success. You have to ensure that from the time they reach your classroom door to the time they leave, that you, as their teacher or as their support staff, have facilitated has facilitated a world-class education each and every day. And as principals, you must ensure that when they set foot on your compound, until when they leave that compound at the end of the day, they are facilitated with a world-class education each and every day. Anything short of that is simply not good enough. Like I said, for 2015-16, it will not be business as usual. The education system needs to reform. I recognize that the system-wide reform that strives to raise student literacy and mathematics levels to the highest international standing, standards is a daunting challenge. Yet, as educators, there remains a moral imperative for you to work together and take decisive action where necessary immediately to overcome these challenging conditions currently being faced in our schools. As a government, we have done just that just recently in cabinet. And I will speak to that in just a moment as well. 
According to Michael Fullan, change is a process, not an event. And that, in order to embark on this process of change, requires a commitment from all stakeholders to join in the journey to actualize sustainable education reform. As I said, as minister, it's always been my stance that students need to come first. This is a value that I'm sure is shared and that I hope is shared, and if not by the end of this meeting, I hope is shared by the vast majority of educators in this room. It must be shared. No excuses, just solutions. This reality has become even more evident in the wake of the baseline school inspection reports and the governance review. So, where do we go from here? It's time to get back to the basics. It's time for the education system to focus on the fundamental tenets of any and all successful schools. That is, teaching and learning, and leadership and management. So it is with great anticipation that I announce the launch of the Cayman Islands Teaching and Learning Strategy 2015 to 2019, which is a 14-point multi-year plan. The strategy will build upon the strengths in the education system currently, while also providing specific tools and objectives that are required to navigate the change process and to create the kind of educational system that will enable all our students to achieve at the highest international standards and certainly at their highest individual potential. The initial focus of this teaching and learning strategy will be on literacy. As literacy is the building block, literacy is the foundation for all other learning. But successful implementation of the objectives outlined in the strategy will improve student achievement in all subject areas. Every objective outlined in the teaching and learning strategy is rooted and anchored in a body of research that has been made to fit within the Cayman Islands context. To reach that goal of raising standards and meeting educational needs of all of our children, we must plan ahead and we must set S-M-A-R-T, SMART targets. Our targets must be specific, our targets must be measurable, our targets must be action-oriented, they must be realistic, and they must be time-bound. So in keeping with the focus on literacy, the specific measurable target for the Cayman Islands is by the end of 2019-2020 academic year, all students will read and write on level by the end of year two. That is the specific, that is the measurable target that we are aiming for in five years' time as a system. However, the specific measurable target by the end of this 2015-2016 academic year, in order to achieve that ultimate target, is to have 85% of students leaving year one who are reading on level. From the 2016-17 school year and for every academic year thereafter, there are specific measurable targets for each year, for year one and year two, culminating, as I said, with 100% of students leaving year two, reading and writing on level. The detailed strategy will be presented and discussed with the schools in the coming weeks and will be made available on the Ministry of Education website thereafter. 
These are ambitious targets, I know, but they are totally able to be achieved. There is nothing in any of those targets that cannot be achieved within the time frame set within the year group specified in this country. And there can be no excuses why we don't achieve them. We have focused on year one and year two as the crucial years in the child's learning that will create the foundation for their success. Principles, this means that you will have to think very carefully about the resources made available for year one and year two and the support you put in place for those year groups in the coming years. And although the teaching and learning strategy primarily focuses on year one and year two, initially and in the, with respect to literacy, that does not mean that the other year groups can take it easy. <laughs> Over the summer, representatives from the Ministry of Education, the Department of Education Services, as well as the lead inspector have, uh, that participated in the baseline school inspections, have come together to review the inspection reports and to develop a plan of action for 2015-2016 school year, which specifically aims to address some of those concerns raised starting this year. And that plan of action, as I said, includes the Cayman Islands teaching and learning strategy, which I just discussed. It was essential that all three entities, the ministry, the department, and the quality assurance arm offered again through the lead inspector, come together to plan the way forward. Principles have also been briefed regarding the 2015-2016 plan of action, the national plan of action, and from what I am made to understand, they are all on board as well. I am also made to understand that historically, this level of collaboration and this kind of cooperation between the various key players in education in our system has not occurred. And so this marks a much needed shift in the working relationship between the key players in the education system. Based on your feedback, as expressed to me directly, as expressed to Councillor Conley, as expressed and reflected in the outcomes of the governance review, strengthening this working relationship and dealing with the issues of mistrust between the various key players in the education system is essential in ensuring that the system is working towards carrying out the government's vision of putting children first, no excuses, just solutions and that the public education system as a whole is united in the aims for significant school improvement and greater student success. The 2015-16 plan of action in this year's implementation plan for the Cayman Islands teaching and learning strategy is, as I said, a concrete implementation plan, and it is linked to the recommendations of both the inspection reports and the findings in the governance review. I must emphasize that as minister, as your minister of education, I am committed to ensuring that the outcomes of the inspection reports are addressed and that the recommendations implemented. And I can speak with confidence, and their mere presence here alone speaks with confidence that this government is committed to ensuring that the outcomes of the inspection reports are addressed and the recommendations are implemented accordingly. This means that you, as educators, must make the same commitment because our children deserve nothing less. During my consultation with educators over the past two years, I received a lot of feedback about the level of autonomy or perceived lack thereof throughout the education system. The Education Governance Review speaks to this as well. It reflects your feedback, those of you that participated 
in those stakeholder meetings. The plan of action therefore provides a framework which gives more autonomy to schools for improving student progress and achievement and gives oversight responsibility to the Department of Education Services. This also means that with increased autonomy comes increased accountability at every level. And as a government, we have made it very clear and the deputy governor, or to the deputy governor, I should say, as a government, we have made it very clear to the deputy governor. And as minister, I've made it very clear to my acting chief officer. The government expects greater accountability in our education system. So as I said, the theme for this year can be summarized as establishing a system of accountability and strengthening our procedures. In summary, the plan of action focuses on two key areas, strengthening leadership and management and improving student progress and achievement. Again, for the interest of time, I will not go into details as to what the plan of action deals with specifically, but over the coming weeks, you all will get briefed by your respective principals and school leaders accordingly. I know I've given you a lot of information, but as I said, I didn't promise to be short, but I promised to be direct. And again, I want to bring to your attention the vision. Children first. As educators, under your leadership and tutelage, I know, I am confident, I've seen the commitment of my own team within the ministry, and I know that they are not alone in this quest to ensure that we achieve our very direct and our very specific goals that have been set for the next several years. But accountability starts as the, at the top, as they say. So I'm happy to report that with respect to my own accountability on behalf of the government, I'm happy to report that everything that I spoke to you about last year and more as the intended course of action for the 2014-2015 school year has either been accomplished or is in process of being finalized. Namely, the revamping of the behavior management system, the conducting of our external evaluations, developing the TVET strategy, developing strengthened education legislation to support the education reform and transformation process required, and to the extent possible, the government has held and continues to hold the ministry team to account in order to deliver on our mandate to raise standards in education. But there was one other commitment made and actioned, action that I called for last year, which I have not spoken about yet, but of which I'm sure many of you have not forgotten. And that is the fact that the government had called on the deputy governor and the portfolio of civil service to conduct a review of the pay and conditions for educators. And that the deputy governor and the portfolio of civil service has agreed or had agreed at that time to do so. I'm also happy to report that in a recent meeting with the deputy governor and POCS, they presented their findings and I'm made to understand that POCS has structured the work to be carried out in two phases. The first phase was conducting a review of the pay inequity that exists for those teachers who have not received an increment in a number of years and whose salaries have remained stagnant and lag behind as compared to the newer recruits in the education system. And the second phase of the work to be done is to conduct a review of the pay and conditions for educators as compared to some of our competitor jurisdictions 
and other relevant leading jurisdictions in terms of educational achievement. As I said, I'm pleased to announce that Pox has completed phase one of the review and has, prevented, has presented a proposal to address the stagnation in equity. And I'm even more pleased to account and to you and to announce to you that the government has agreed that starting this academic year, the salaries for those individuals who qualify with respect to the pay stagnation proposal will be adjusted. As I said, accountability starts at the top. And so, as you've heard me say many times, on behalf of the government, we say what we mean, and we mean what we say, and we try as best as possible to deliver. Everyone needs to do our part to ensure that our students succeed. But we realize that to keep people motivated, to keep you motivated, to deal, we needed to deal with this long-standing issue which has negatively affected morale amongst many long-serving teachers. And we needed to deal with this issue to move the system forward because these inequities needed to be addressed. I would like to publicly thank the Premier, Minister Borden, all of my colleagues in Cabinet and members of the government who have committed to help find the funds necessary just this week. We have committed to find the funds necessary to address the inequity starting this year. And the reason we just were able to give that commitment this week was because we just got the proposal. So we certainly did not sit as a government and wait and make an excuse for why this couldn't be addressed in this academic year. The cabinet has given a commitment to ensure that we can move forward with dealing with this stagnation inequity. During the coming year, the Ministry of Education and POCS will continue in their assessment as it relates to phase two of the review, as I just outlined. And for the government's further consideration once the review is completed. Rest assured that I gave you a commitment last year on behalf of the government, and we have fulfilled that commitment to the extent possible given what has been presented to us in this regard. Once again, I commit as minister on behalf of the government, I will push to see that phase two of the review continues in a timely fashion. And you should know as I said, that you have the support at the highest level in government in that regard. I also want to acknowledge briefly the private sector and non-governmental participation in the education system. As I said, we continue on this journey of excellence, but we don't continue alone. I would like to once again thank and recognize organizations such as CISPA, Life, Cayman Finance, Hedge Funds Care, the Special Needs Foundation, and all others who contribute to our education system through partnerships that exist or through donation of resources and volunteers. Again, the value of these partnerships in education cannot be underestimated and I believe we can do more to create meaningful participation with the private sector and non-governmental organizations. And this is something that we will continue to actively pursue in the coming year. I also want to acknowledge the role of the media in education. Firstly, I want to thank all members of the media who are in attendance here today. I want to thank Radio Cayman for airing this live and also thank CIGTV for agreeing to show this in the coming days. And all other print and other media who are represented, who took the time to be here this morning. I want to thank you. I also want to underscore the vital role that you play in 
our education reform process. As journalists, you can either help to get the message across in a way that is constructive, in a way that helps us achieve as a country our goal to raise standards and to offer world-class education right here at home. Or you can choose to hurt by just focusing on creating the next sensational headline at the expense of our children. I challenge you, as I've challenged the educators in this room, please adopt a children first approach when you are reporting on matters related to education. I want to remind you I want to remind you of your responsibility to report responsibly and also to remind you how powerful the messages portrayed in the media are to young, impressionable minds. Before you commit pen to paper or finger to keyboard or voice to microphone, think, how is what I'm about to say or write going to negatively or positively affect our children. As a community, we all have a role to play, we all have a responsibility, and we all owe our children our best efforts in that regard. In closing, <laughs> I want to say and reiterate, Education is the key to success in life. And I don't speak this as just some adage. I speak this from personal experience. I speak this from the values that have been instilled in me and instilled in, I, I would venture, every single one of you in this room. That is why you're here. That is why you're involved in the education system. And that is why we cannot afford to fail our children. A good teacher inspires hope. It, you ignite imagination and you instill a love for learning. But on the other hand, a teacher who is attempting to teach without inspiring your students with a desire to learn is, in my mind, attempting to make water flow upwards. Teachers, if you take that spark of learning that every child has, no matter what their circumstances, you can take a child from any background, from whatever personal circumstance, to a lifetime of creativity, curiosity, achievement, and success. A teacher affects eternity. No one can ever tell where your influence stops. Remember that in your day-to-day -day interactions with our children. Remember that in your attempts to create history from this day forth. The results of the baseline inspection show that our children will rise to the expectations set for them. As educators, if you have no or low expectations, then guess what? That is exactly what they will achieve. As minister, I'm committed to the very highest standards of education, and I speak with authority that the government is also committed to the very highest standards for all of our students in all of our schools. But we recognize that no one can rest. We must all, always strive to be amongst the best. 
And I'm sure that you will agree that education of our children is the most important gift we can give them to ensure their future success. And as your minister, I will not shrink from this task, and neither will I fail to offer my full and unqualified support as we strive together to provide the very best education for the children of this country. As a government, we are committed, and I have demonstrated in concrete, specific accounting to you today, we have demonstrated our commitment, and we will continue to do so. So with that, I thank you, and I wish God's richest blessings for the forthcoming year, and again remind you of our vision, children first, no excuses, just solutions.